Asia biology. I work um, in the Serengeti in Tanzania in East Africa, in Yellowstone, down in Panama, where, where, where I teach with Victor, and up in the Arctic. And I do nerdy theoretical models in cocktail bars and coffee shops all around the world. I would say that climate change impacts multiple aspects of my work. The transmission dynamics of many parasites and pathogens is driven by climate, particularly temperature and rainfall. So changes in those will change pathogen risk and the efficacy of control methods. The COVID pandemic has had a huge impact on the world. It, it, it's probably the biggest economic impact on the world we've seen since maybe the 17th century. It's having a huge, huge effect. And it will have an effect that's going to affect everything that happens in the global economy for the next five years to a decade. Uh, it's good practice for what climate change and the loss of biodiversity is going to do to the global economy, because they're likely to be much worse. What's more, the COVID epidemic is an epiphenomenon of this loss of biodiversity. It, it, it's an example of the sort of disaster that can happen when we mess around with biodiversity without knowing what we're doing. So, um, A, it's giving us good practice that having to deal with these global catastrophes is something that politically, we've got to be able to be much more adept at being able to do that. But the other thing it's taught us that being prepared and doing something ahead of time to stop disasters like this happening is crucial. And ultimately, however much this has cost, and it could easily be $30 trillion, um, climate change and loss of biodiversity are gonna be much, much more expensive, but spending money to stop them happening is now gonna be vividly seen as really cost-effective. What, what is the role then of, of teachers and schools in helping to address this kind of like growth of misinformation? How, how can schools be uh, part of that process in helping to, in, to engage good information to our communities? Well, I, I think the crucial thing there is that teachers need to educate children to understand science in particular, particularly the science of climate change, but also massively the science of biology and how important biodiversity is to the human economy, welfare, health, etc. Having a much better educated public will make it easier for that public to apply sharper antennae to the, 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 the flood of misinformation that comes out from politicians. I, I mean, the bottom line, if you look at the data, is that politicians are not people you would want to trust because it's hard to tell which ones are lying and which ones are telling the truth. So it's much better to make your own opinion. And in particular, science should not be a political issue. So science is dealing with facts. Politicians are dealing with getting themselves reelected. So, so they, they can try and interpret science in a way that turns it into policy, but to try and politicize things like whether or not people should be vaccinated, whether or not this is a virus or a disease or not, is total nonsense. And, and it undermines the entire political process. So educating people is the best way to stop that happening. I'm sorry. Equally, Go ahead. Sorry. Scientists need to do a better job of communicating what they understand more clearly to a broader audience. As my friend uh, yeah. Schneider, who was massively influential in the 80s about getting the whole agenda for thinking about climate change going, as Steve said, it's our role to educate people from kindergarten right down to Senate subcommittee. <laughs> He's That's right. Awesome. You have to get your message across at all those levels. And it's, 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 it's a point worth noting that there's very few scientists in Congress, right? That, that it's there, also... There were four, uh, of which half are scientists in that they are funeral directors, which unless we do something about climate, that is going to be the biggest job growth area. Uh, and there are one physicist on either side of the Senate. 
Well, there used to be. There's now down to three, I think. If we... Not a single yeah. biologist. So, so... Gotta get one. Gotta get one. Like, what was the moment that you know you first learned about climate change, or perhaps most importantly, when did you realize that it was a social issue, not just a scientific issue? That's a really interesting question, and I, it was good for me to think about that uh, because actually, the first time it really came home to me as an issue was when I was asked to give a talk. At a, at a meeting in, in Washington, which was actually held in October, 1988. And it was a symposium jointly organized by uh, the Smithsonian and World Wildlife Fund to put together a book on climate change and biodiversity. So I was asked to give a paper on climate change and pathogens. As I went to the meeting and the meeting was super because it provided a three day overview of how climate change what the known science of climate change was, and then that was just before we had the first IPCC meeting on climate change to say this was a problem we had to deal with. And it also had a bunch of people come in and ask, how will this affect different aspects of biodiversity? And it was a, a bunch of us, I can tell you exactly when it was, because we went out for uh, dinner one night and we went on to a bar because we wanted to see the vice presidential debate, which was the famous vice presidential debate between Lloyd Benson and Dan Quayle, where, when Benson pointed out that Dan Quayle was no Jack Kennedy. Uh, and unfortunately, you know, Quayle went on to become the vice president and George Bush was then elected president. But Bush, because of the IPCC report, was very keen to do something about climate change. And the meeting we went to was, was, was actually, I thought, wow, this is a huge problem that we're going to have to deal with. So literally on the train, I wrote a little article uh, about climate change and biodiversity. It was the first piece ever published in Trends in Ecology and Evolution on climate change and how it's going to affect biodiversity. So that was back 1989 that came out. Ironically, Bush went, took office saying he was going to do something to, about this. And the uh, petroleum industry and his buddies there completely talked him out of it. Similarly, he went to Rio in 1992 to sign the Convention on Biodiversity. And the uh, people in the biotech and pharmaceutical industry talked him out of doing it. Mm. But that got to me that the second sort of big lesson of these things, these were huge problems that when you, the politicians listened to the scientists, they wanted to do something about it. When the people who pay for their elections talk to them, in both cases, they talk them out of doing anything about it. I told you how easily a politician could be bought by people with vested interests. So what, what would you say to, to a, a school administrator who says, well, you know what, we really don't want to teach climate change because it's a controversial issue. And so like evolution, maybe we, we think it should be best taught at home. What would you say to, what would you say to one of those school administrators that say, well, that's controversial. Maybe we should, we shouldn't teach it. Unless we teach climate change in school, there won't be a next century for homo sapiens. If you had an administrator like that in school, I would discourage my kid from going there. I would discourage my university from taking applicants from that school, but I would lobby the school kids to be out there every Friday striking with not wanted posters for those administrators to say, we're not wanting these people administering our school. You know, if you have a really crap administrator, either promote them to go somewhere else or you know, find another task for them. I just think it's essential that climate change be taught in school for the reasons we mentioned earlier, that people can then make more informed decisions about the sort of garbage that flows through the internet. Um, it's also important to point out that climate change will increasingly exasperate inequality, it'll generate crime, and but there will be a wide variety of jobs for people who understand it because most of this century will be spent trying to fight and reverse climate change. So it's central knowledge that people to learn about. Teach climate change. What do you think teachers should know about climate change? I think the crucial things is that climate change is intimately coupled to the loss of tropical habitats. And, and stopping 
tropical forest destruction and restoring tropical forests and other habitats is the only way we're going to reverse climate change. And here it's important to differentiate between slowing it down and reversing it. There's a huge emphasis on doing things such as changing your lifestyle, buying an electric car, riding your bike, um, using, taking less airline flights, that all slows down the rate at which we put greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. But there's so many up there at the moment that what we actively need to do is find ways of removing gases from the atmosphere. And the only way we've got that will work in the time available is tropical forests. Any of the machines that people are trying to make will not be scaled up to be operating at a global scale in anything like the short period of time we have available. So it's restoration and teaching that is vital. And this deep irony that I am more worried about loss of biodiversity than I am about climate change, because I suspect that the impacts of loss of biodiversity will be felt earlier than the, the change in climate. But it's doubly important because the loss of particularly tropical forests removes from us our main weapon to be able to fight climate change and reverse it. So being able to teach that and get that message across, I think is vital. And how about for students, for young students, you know, I've, I, it was uh, told to me by a good friend of mine who's a teacher that says, well, you know what, like teachers need to be careful when they talk to, to students, particularly the younger ones about, about you know, ecological collapse, about climate change, because it's depression, it's depressing, it's deeply depressing. And in a way she said, you know what, like first, I, I like to first instill a love for nature and children because it, it starts with that love for the environment. It starts with that love and that personal relationship, that connection that kids have with nature. She said, because if you, if you teach them about climate change and about biodiversity loss without having them establish that love, she says, it's kind of like couples counseling on your first date, Yeah. right? right. Um, so so what, what would you tell students, um, young people about the importance about, of, of learning and, and uh, about climate change and, and, and biodiversity. What message do you have to those young people? Well, again, I, I, I think having more biology and natural history, local natural history taught in schools, I think is vital. Uh, it, it's really important to learn about the world that surrounds you. And it's it's much more exciting than things you see on Twitter or, or, or Instagram once you get into it. And if it really is exciting, you can stick it on Instagram and get other people excited about it. Actively getting involved is vital. Going and working and helping restoring local natural habitats will get you to meet fun, like-minded people and get you to learn more natural history. Um, I also think, you know, as you get more involved with it, follow Greta Thunberg's example strike every Friday, get out on the streets and protest, learn about the environment and educate your elders about it and refuse to back down when they suggest larger or alternative issues are more important. And simply you know, encourage your parents to divest their savings from fossil fuels and big pharma. Say, so, you know, this money's for me to go to college. I want it to be invested in things that I, don't want to feel bad about later when it's paying for me to go through college. And you know, the strongest hold we have over industry is being able to have thousands of people divest from investing in them. The more we do that, the bigger we can get, the bigger influence we can get, because those, just as the politicians need the money to get elected, the, the big companies need those the, the investment in them to be able to do the research they do and the endless advertising to convince people they're honest. Um, do you think that there's a trend happening, there's a change happening within the, the political sphere on how politicians and society is, is starting to understand the urgency of climate change? Yeah, I, I genuinely do. And I, and I think the thing that's most influenced them have been these Friday strikes and those huge climate 
marches we were seeing uh, in the fall of 2019, that that whole movement had really gained momentum and politicians were having to listen. Uh, and it's deeply frustrating that the, that the COVID pandemic has knocked this back, that the people involved with that and then the extinction movement should be organizing behind the scenes. So as once everybody's vaccinated, they can come back and say, look, this was a warning. You didn't do a great job as politicians in responding to scientific advice. The scientists are gonna say, I think climate change and extinction are gonna be much, much worse. So get your act together or we'll be out here in our millions every Friday. Do you feel that the COVID pandemic has taught us certain lessons that we could more broadly apply to, to resiliency and climate change? I think the key lesson that will emerge is you've got to have a unified approach. Um, you know, if the scientists say, we've all got to massively change our behavior to deal with this pandemic. In many cases, you know, 99% of people did that and it really did help slow down the uh, rate of expansion of the pandemic in the countries that followed those rules. When people disobeyed them, they're now seeing the cost as you, as you massively see in the US and you see in the UK. The, the other thing, it, it, it was a great way of unifying people together to, 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 to sort of say, no, if we've all done this together, we should get a good feeling of, of having beaten it as a team. And, and that's going to be important for both loss of biodiversity and, and, and climate change. It's also listen to the scientists. They're not talking nonsense. They're not doing this uh, to expand th their own egos. There's enough of them saying this and, and saying it with increasingly strident voices that it's important we do something about it. And if you look at the evidence and get unbiased people to look at the evidence they're presenting, it's urgent. What is your ultimate message for young people that, that want to find their place in, in this movement? Um, what would be your advice to them? I think that the most important thing is, A, you've got to see this as the biggest battle of your generation and the previous generations who failed to take it on adequately and the next couple of generations are all who are so going to have to fight this battle. Um, that means you both have to get engaged politically, getting out on the streets, but also educate yourself about it. And through that education, find a way to work to stop it. Uh, they're all the fun, exciting jobs are going to be things like you and I do, working as biologists, going out into the field, doing restoration, working on tropical diseases, uh, working on biodiversity, working on climate. Those are really exciting career opportunities and being able to work in them in, in the fantastic places we work or even locally just around where you're living will get you to meet other exciting like-minded people and they, they will fully fulfill all the excitement you would ever want in your sort of social life uh, but it'll also help you surround yourself with people who politically and intellectually understand the importance of the crisis and the need for you to work together to deal with it. Think of Greta Thunberg. Now, one week she's the only kid out there on school strike just over a year later, it's millions of kids all around the world out there. And that, you know, she feels much stronger yeah. because all those other people are out there and all of those are other are empowered by her example. The best thing that's happened, Greta, is on the environment and on biodiversity in my lifetime. It's the voice of youth and the fact that she is not in any position to be corruptible. Uh, and too many of the other people are either thinking of their own egos as they got older or are in a, a, a political system that's been definition almost polycorrupt. Yeah. Or maybe she has the vision to see that, you know, she's on the precipice with everything around her is plummeting down. Uh, and very few other people are actually seeing that. Uh, but then they realize that, hold it, she has no motivation to say anything other than what she's actually seeing and other people 
believe that that to be true, whereas other people you think, these people have got a mixed agenda. 